Wow. Just a fantastic mail. Wow. Man, I don't know if they get any prettier, you know? And that's a fantastic specimen. I can never quite capture the beauty of these things. You know, when I was young, I used to read stories about the uh, classic uh, wet flies and, uh, you know, fishing for trout in Maine and in different places here in the Adirondacks. And um, I was always intrigued with the flies. I could never really tie them very well. My hands were rough and the, it would shred the thread and it uh, never really worked out. But uh, I loved fly fishing and I think it was somewhere about probably close to 45 years ago I started um, dragging, I say dragging, it's trolling wet flies uh, and nymphs around a pond and uh, lo and behold I started catching some fish and, uh, and then I started reading about it more and more and uh, oh I want to say I've been doing it a number of years and uh, in 1980 uh, I became, became a, a wilderness ranger for New York State. My boss was a um, forest ranger out of North River, Vic Sassy, fantastic man, and uh, we hit it off very well. And uh, he said, oh, you, you fly fish that way with the wet flies and sinking lines? And I said, yeah. And he said, I do that all the time too. And I said, fantastic, you know? So. When we got uh, days off, we would go in and we would fish. And uh, between the two of us, we kind of fed a lot off of each other, you know. And we fished, and as a ranger, you know, I got a chance to meet people. And I, I bump into a, a guy, uh, Roger Menard was his name. And he really took to me for some reason. And he would come up, he lived in the Catskills, and uh, he would come up and every weekend he would look me up and he'd give me flies. He'd say, oh, you gotta try this, you know, this is a such and such, and uh, I tie these up, you know, and over the years, he ended up giving me hundreds and hundreds of flies that he tied, and, uh, and then one day I was talking to somebody uh, about this friend of mine, and uh, I said, it's Roger, his name is Roger Menard, and they looked at me and said, what, you know Roger Menard? I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, who's Roger Menard? And they go, you don't know who Roger Menard is? And I said, yeah, he's a friend of mine. He's a fly fisherman. And I said, no, he's, he's revered everywhere. And I said, he, uh, he's written a bunch of books and he's a renowned fly fisherman. And I'm thinking, are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, He's just Roger to me. He never told me that he was anybody special, but he's a special friend of mine. And uh, so, you know, just through that friendship, you know, you learn more and more as you sit and talk with the guy. Now, Roger's, he's passed on too. And, uh, but, uh, you know, through the years, uh, I've, I've done a lot of it in the last 25 years. I've kind of perfected my technique and uh, I've used a lot of different level sinking lines, mostly level sinking lines. I've used sink tips. Um, they make weight forward. I have a weight forward uh, full sink line. But uh, what I've found the best luck with is the old level sinking lines. And uh, I have maybe 10 or 12 different ones. They range from uh, twos, threes, fours. Uh, I've got what they called Cortland used to call a super sink. I've had the line 25 years. The line will drop down 25, 30 feet below the surface. And uh, you'd be surprised in the summertime when the, the uh, fish are down deep, what you can do with that line. And uh, you know, you have to know your ponds, know the depth of the pond and uh, you know, after you've fished them a while, you understand where the fish are, where the deepest part of the pond is, what time of year they might be there. Um, and as the seasons change and the water temperatures change, you adjust your technique to where you uh, surmise the fish will be. Now today, you know, we have all sorts of fancy stuff, fish finders and depth finders and 
you know, they locate exactly what depth the fish are at. But after doing it for 40 some years, I pretty much know where the fish are at certain times of the year and at certain temperatures of the water. And, uh, and you know, I fish accordingly. And you can vary your speed, you know, uh, say you had a, a level sinking line number three, and uh, if you dragged along at a certain speed, and you know, I can't tell you what the speed is. I know what the speed is from doing it for many, many years. Uh, and then if I, I know that I'm coming to a little shallower part of the pond and I want to raise my fly, then I, I put a little more speed to it. And it brings the fly up. Um, <clears throat> all the lines are different, even some of them that are designated the same. And after you're fishing for a little while, you figure it out. And uh, you start fishing accordingly. And sometimes you got to go, now wait a minute, I have this line on. Let me see this usually. And, you know, as you work it through in your mind, then you either slow your speed or, or uh, quicken your pace just a little bit. And, uh, and the type of fly you use, you know, depend will will affect the speed in which you pull it. I know a lot of people uh, fish a streamer fly much faster than they would a, a wet fly or a nymph. Um, I haven't found that to be uh, a general rule of thumb though. I have not, uh, I have fished streamer flies extremely slow and caught big brook trout deep. And uh, so I don't think that uh, that's a, a blanket rule. Uh, I know it's not, uh, and I do use uh, streamer flies. I like tandems. Uh, there's a, one particular pattern that I really, really like. Um, but, you know, they all catch fish. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of history behind it, but uh, I love it. There's nothing like catching uh, brook trout on a fly rod. Uh, you know, there's nothing between you and the fish. And you know, there's no hard tackle. The the rods are limber. You feel every every throb of the trout's um, <clears throat> fight. And uh, a, cool for, oh, a fly, of course, is catching the fish. You know, in the mouth, in the lip, usually. And uh, you know, when you bring a fish in, it's very easy to take a fish off without injuring it and putting it back in the water. And uh, I probably handle trout uh, more than most guys that release their fish, but I know how to handle them and I don't injure them. And uh, sometimes it's just to enjoy the presence of the fish for a little while. You know, you get a really nice fish and you want to enjoy it. And, you know, after a little while, I, I let them go. Brook trout fishing is a fantastic thing. And uh, when the males are in their uh, spawning regalia in the fall of the year, there's nothing more beautiful. I think they're the most beautiful fish that God ever created as a brook trout. And the coloration is fantastic. And uh, just to have your hands on a, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 inch brook trout in their spawning colors is really, really special. And uh, of course they're fantastic eating too. And I do eat a few, but uh, as I've gotten older and older, I eat less of them and, and let most of them go. And uh, we just have a blast with it. Uh, I can't imagine fishing any other way. Um, I've just, uh, over the years, uh, I've, I've got my favorite flies that I use. I don't divulge them. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, you work hard to figure out what you, th you think works really well and uh, your techniques. And, and, you know, it just it evolves over the years as you work at it. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just go to a pond and, and you know what'll work, uh, a pond that you know well. I used to, uh, if I wanted a couple of fish to eat in the summertime, you know, most people think you can't catch brook trout in the summer, they just don't bite. You know, spring and fall and the rest of the time you, you leave them alone. But, uh, you know, you do have to be careful in the summer because the water temperature is very warm and uh, you can tax the fish. If you weren't going to take them, then I would say don't fish them. But uh, I used to go in sometimes right in the middle of July. I remember one time I went into a favorite pond of mine. I knew the uh, water was, the deepest part of the pond was about 15 feet. And that's where all the fish are. 
when the uh, water temperatures are warm, the only place where it's cold is down at the very bottom. And so I would use a, they call it a swan and day nymph, and actually they, they have a wrapped body on them. And when they sink, they sink with a, the hook is facing up. And uh, I would put one of those on. They imitate a, a dragonfly nymph. What I would do is once I had about 90 feet of line out behind me, I would uh, get my oars ready because now I'm drifting. You know, the wind is taking a little bit. And then I would just watch the tip of the rod. And when that fly was ready to make contact with the, with the bottom, you just see a very just perceptible tip of the rod tip. And that told me the fly just touched down. And I had my oars ready to go, and then I'd just twitch. I'd pull them forward, and it would bring the fly up out of the mud, and then I'd just let it settle again. And I'd watch the rod tip, and the moment I saw it touch the bottom, twitch it again. Usually the second or third, wham, they would hit that thing like a freight train. And I remember that one day, it was 95 degrees. It was as humid as it could get. And I took three beautiful brook trout. The biggest was three pounds. And the other two were between two and two and a half pounds. And I took them home to eat, but it was just unbelievable. I could have stayed and caught one right after another, but three was as many as I wanted to eat. And I didn't want to tax the fish because it's one of those shallow ponds and you pull them up and you, you fight like that and you're liable to kill the fish. So uh, I did take three home to eat and uh, they were delicious. Um, do you want to tell us what kind of weight you're using on your rod? Well, there's a lot of different weights you can use, but I find, you know, if you use the, the lightest weight uh, for what you want to do, uh, you know, I wouldn't go on a pond with a three weight, but uh, I like a five weight. It does all that I want it to do. I don't do a lot of casting, although a five weight really is uh, nice, but what is important to me is uh, a high quality reel that has a really good drag system and a large arbor. Uh, this is a Lansom, Lansom Waterworks reel. It's one of their lesser models. Uh, they're not cheap, but they're, it is one of their lesser models. Uh, it's called the Guru, and I have three of these, but I really like them. I like the large arbor. What it allows is for you to take up line in a hurry. Well, oftentimes when you're fishing for brookies out on a, a pond, when they hit that thing, they hit it like a freight train. And you want to be able to gain line on them if, they, if they're running at the boat. And, uh, you know, most brook trout come in and, you know, probably under a minute or in a couple of minutes. Uh, and then you get them to the boat and sometimes it's another few minutes, two, two or three sometimes. There's a f fish run sometimes with a line. But some of the really big ones, you really have some fight on your hand, hands. And I have, uh, I've had one fish that I actually, as far as I can remember, I kept looking at my watch. I had a fish on that was about 25 minutes bringing it to the boat. And uh, I don't mind telling you, I was almost like a little kid. I was shaking a little bit when I finally got it in the net. But it was over four pound brook trout. And it was the strongest fish I've ever fought for sure because it just kept taking line. I, when I first got within sight of the boat, uh, I couldn't really get a good look at it. I just saw it swirl and I saw the tail and I could see it was a male. And uh, it took off and it stripped all 90 feet of my line out and about 30 feet of backer. And I stood there staring at the reel going, are you serious? And then finally it quit. And when it did, then I started reeling back up. You have to be so careful with these big trout once they get in that size class. When they make a run, when they make a turn, if you've got your hand on the handle or if you're pinning the line to the, they're gone. They break the, the tippet and, they, and they're off. And uh, that fish, I got him about halfway in the second run and he took off again and uh, it was four full strips of my line down to the backer and you know of course my I envisioned in my mind maybe this is the biggest trout I've ever seen <laughs> it was a beauty but it was definitely the strongest fighting fish and finally when uh, I got him in after the fourth trip I, I realized as I was bringing him in I said no he's definitely worn down and, uh, and I was able to, 
bring him up to the side of the boat and he slid right up on the side and I put a net over him. And you know, <clears throat> if you've never had a four pound brook trout in a, in a trout net, you go to raise him up out of the water, it's like it wants to crank right out of your hand. And I swung him right into the boat and there were other people fishing on this, this pond and they had kind of stopped, they were out in the water. And there were three guys together and <clears throat> they finally said, well, that was a fish you were fighting. My goodness, you had it on for half an hour. And I said, well, pretty near, I think. And they said, hold it up so we can see it. I said, not on your life, not yet. <laughs> I said, I got to get this thing tied off. I'm not holding it up and taking the chance of it flipping out of my hand and over the side, you know. But uh, I finally did get it uh, tied onto a stringer. Not a stringer, but a, a paracord carefully and then uh, tied to the thwart and it's interesting if it was just any old fish you know you three or four wraps on the thwart not you know two or three knots and that's it and this fish you find yourself one knot two knot three knot you know you want to have five or six knots on both ends of this thing so the trout doesn't get off and uh, that was a fantastic fish and a fantastic memory and that was probably, it, it's a day that stands out in my mind more than any other because uh, I think there were a lot of other people fishing on the pond, but no one was fishing with the flies like I was. I don't think anyone, I know no one else had a fly rod at all. But uh, what I was doing was unbelievably attractive to the fish. And I was talking to a lot of different people. This is a very large pond. And there was a lot of people there, and they were camping and uh, fishing. And most people I talked to had caught at least one fish, but they mostly said it was a fairly slow day. Well, it was not a slow day for me. And uh, I did lose track. I think the, the total count of fish was over 30. And by afternoon, I was, I was taking 18-inch brook trout and not even putting a net on them playing them out completely, sliding them right up alongside of the canoe, reaching down with my other hand, and just turning the fly out of their mouth and whew, watch them go. Go, wow, thank you, Lord, another beauty. <laughs> Put it back out, and five minutes later, bang, I've got another one. And I'll never forget it. You know, it was just a, one of those fantastic days that God allowed me to enjoy on, out in his creation, so. It's been a wonderful sport, and, uh, Hope to do it till the day I die. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jim.